very, very nice to be here. But I'm going to have to warn you, I'm going to dumb down absolutely everything that Jonathan said and uh, start us at a very low level from which you can all rise as the conference proceeds. Um, where are we? But what I'm going to do is um, start with the technology that uh, Jonathan says is, is the core of what's going on. And um, I'm going to make what G. Spencer Brown, philosopher of hippies, called the first distinction. And I want to talk a little bit about that hardware-software divide that um, most of us find ourselves uh, on one side of or the other. Okay. So this all goes back to a quote from one of my oldest friends in the music world, Ron Quibble. In 1986, he came up to me out of the blue and he said, we have to make computer music that sounds like electronic music, which may seem like a somewhat stupid observation to make. Um, this was a time when most electronic music was simply referred to as boops and beats. Aficionados and foes alike. But um, Quibla actually hit, hit the nail on the head, which is this was uh, two years after the introduction of, of a fair amount of MIDI-based audio equipment and the movement of computers into uh, many genres of music. And in fact, we come to a fork in the musical road and boops and beeps now spun off into bits and beeps at the same time, and there was a difference. There was a difference. So uh, Ron and I met at Wesleyan University in the 1970s when we were both students of Alma Lucier, and Lucier encouraged us to um, get involved in making circuits. That was the heyday of homemade electronic circuits. We studied with great masters like David Tudor and David Behrman, and we made terrible circuits. This, my wife saw that. She doesn't have a cruel bone in her body, and she looked at it, and she said it looks like it was made by Fred Flintstone. So that is, we did. We were very bad engineers, but the ethos of the time, we were working in a very a distinctly post-Cajun genre, meant that bad circuits sometimes produce actually rather good music, possibly better than it would have had it functioned correctly. But, by the end of the 70s, the first uh, microcomputers were introduced uh, in the United States. And what you're looking at is what is essentially the, the 1978 equivalent of an Arduino. Uh, it cost about 10 times as much, and it ran 10 times as slow. Uh, it had a tenth the memory. But it was an astonishing transformation for those of us who were burning ourselves with soldering irons. And as I have always told people, Command Z is a lot easier than desoldering when it comes to undoing the mistakes. But um, by 1985, 86, middle of the decade, you had a proliferation of two things. You had MIDI controlled synthesizers of rather remarkable audio sophistication, and you had uh, computers that came with relatively robust operating systems, and people were writing software that allowed you to do sequencing and voice editing and things like that. Now, it's an interesting point in the history of the technology, which is that computers at the time, CPUs were not fast enough to do direct sound production. Okay? Um, MIDI uh, was a, a stopgap solution, which is that inside every synthesizer was dedicated sound circuitry. It was simply overseen and, and, and managed by a CPU. <coughs> And the MIDI communication protocol, like any other communication protocol, your USB, your serial, your Ethernet, was simply a way of getting information between the host computer that you would be working on and the one that was actually producing music. Um, unfortunately for a lot of us uh, who thought of ourselves as composers with a capital C, MIDI was, was a little like Esperanto. It was a, it was a very finite language, and it was, it was focused very much on that which was the most uh, 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 profitable from a business standpoint aspect of the music industry, which is making notes. Notes. Like those instruments make notes. Okay? And um, it, it tended to favor sort of note-driven, time-based events. Uh, 
which stood in a marked contrast to the ethos out of which many of us were working, which was, quite frankly, a chaotic mess. And this produced a distinctly different type of music. Um, this was also the time in which MIDI was allowing us to sort of create these exploded instruments where there was a great separation between the performance and the actual sound. You had controllers that would connect to other things. And there was power, but there were very definite impediments. Okay? Now, 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 we are here, and we are in a state where the sound and, and for that matter, video production capabilities of a computer uh, exceed those of the DSPs and, and synthesis engines of the 80s in terms of pure horsepower. Uh, one can theoretically do anything, like a wiggly line over it, uh, that one could have done with the earlier generation of hardware-based processing. And yet, not to spoil the party, I hear a difference. I still hear a difference between computer music and electronic music. So, what I want to talk about are, are distinctions between hardware and software in terms of the way, primarily in terms of the way they influence how you go about making music, okay? The thought process, the conceptual process. And the decisions you make early on in the, in, in, in the act of music making that cause you to choose one solution over the other. Now, it's somewhat of an arbitrary distinction because most electronic music today uh, combines hardware and software, right? Computers and iPhones ultimately reach us through amps and speakers, which are incredibly analog devices. And an awful lot of uh, hardware-based practice, say like circuit bending, when you look real close inside, you see little blobs that are in fact microcontrollers running rampant around the circuitry. There's very little purity anymore. But at the same time, I maintain that arrays of semiconductors on a circuit board and lines of code and software have specific distinctive traits that are inherent to their domains. You know? And that depending on the balance of hardware and software in a given piece of technology, in a given object, in a given instrument, there is a certain sort of softwareness or hardwareness embedded in the device. And we're usually pretty sensitive to that. And uh, that manifests itself on a number of levels. Uh, one is pure sound. Sometimes there's a sonic distinction between the two resources. Structure, the way you organize sound over time, is very often determined by which of those technologies has a dominant hand. The working hats that you develop in creating work with a particular technology. You, know, you develop different habits. The way you gesture when you smoke is different from the way you gesture when you drink. And hopefully you do neither. And it affects your performance style. Performs the way you approach the instrument you know, on stage. Um, the influence of, the, of this technology on these working habits can be overt or covert. All right? You may know what's going on, you may not. It can also be overcome. I like to say that you know, even a short guy can play basketball, but it's a challenge, okay? And you tend to follow the path of least resistance when you're looking at the capabilities of these technologies. So what I want to do is draw attention to what I regard as the distinctive differences, to use a linguistic term, between hardware and software, how they influence the way we work, and how historic persistence in these genres, in these media, in these tools, predispose us to make decisions and assumptions based on which technology we've chosen. Um, before I get into this, I'd like to make, express a few caveats. Now, this, is, this is classic um, practice-based research. This is based on direct observation of my own work, that of my peers, my mentors, uh, in a relatively fringe area of music, as I will admit. Um, it is not based on erudite research. Uh, when I refer to hardware, I'm actually talking about not just circuitry, but any fundamentally mechanical device. Something that is hard. Yeah? Acoustic and electric instruments included. When I refer to software, though, I'm basically talking about code. And this can be code of the sort that we run on our, our personal computers, or it can be code that's embedded in a microcontroller, in a DSP, but it's code. Uh, I, I toss around the word infinite. And all I mean, 
excuse me, is a hell of a lot. All right, it doesn't mean infinite. And likewise, random just means really unpredictable when I use it. I know I'm wrong, but I'm too old to learn. So here, here are a handful of traits that I see. Um, dimensionality. Uh, acoustics are 3D, even 4D. And there's this sense of sound filling a space over time. And those of us who move back and forth between working with instruments and working with speakers are aware of that brilliant sense of physical presence that comes from musicians distributed on stage that, that, that no sound dispersion system ever seems to be able to, uh, to imitate. Um, circuits are two-dimensional. They're plain, okay? That you can have simultaneous activity taking place. You can have several threads of, of current flow on it, but they are on a plane. Uh, Alma Lucier once made Ron Quiula very angry by saying in an interview with Robert Ashley, um, I'm not interested in circuits because circuits are flat and sound is three-dimensional. And I have to say, he had a point. Now, <coughs> circuits are flat, but there is a sense of parallelism which stands in marked contrast to software, which is fundamentally a lie. All right? All code is fundamentally sequential. Yeah. Whether you're, 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 you're making little patched together blocks with PD or Max, or you're writing your code in Super Collider, in the end, it's always a linear execution of instructions. And there are obviously parallel computing systems, but still those lines are running strictly independently and linearly. And that actually affects the way you think about a problem. Because when you solve the problem in code, you think of it as a sequence of steps. And you don't necessarily do that when you solve a problem on a guitar fingerboard or in a circuit. Hardware resides in the physical world. And as I get older and I continue to carry around pieces of electronic music <coughs> that works with heavy hardware, I look at my friends who are laptop artists, and I think, ah, there but for the grace of God go I. In other words, hardware is heavy. Hardware is real. It has these finite <coughs> qualities to it. Think about a potentiometer, right? Technically, what we call a knob. Okay, something you turn, something you slide. It has limits. It moves 280 degrees, or it moves 10 centimeters. And it doesn't go any further. If you want a number a little bit bigger, that's tough, okay? That's what it does. Hardware has edges, yeah? Software, on the other hand. Software is ethereal. Software is what you make of it, right? <coughs> if you program a potentiometer in code, all right, and let's say it has a range of one to 100, and then you decide, actually, it would be great if it went to 101, you can do it. You don't have to chip away at the strata of the potentiometer and weld on another little bit of metal. Okay. I need a page turn. So hardware has physical givens that are there when you pick the instrument up. And software is always kind of like jello. It's always changing its dimension. It can be easily moved and adapted for what you're doing. Hardware this is one of the things I love most about hardware-based systems. Hardware has what I call non-linear adjacencies. All right? Think about plucking a note on a guitar, and then you very slowly raise your fretting finger up so that the string rattles against the fret and dies out. Again, what guitars refer to as a skronk. Okay? That noise is made by a fraction of a millimeter of movement of your finger. Now, you can program the infamous car plus strong plucked string algorithm developed by a classmate of Ron and mine at Wesleyan, by the way. This is a shout out. Beautiful little piece of code makes a very effective, very, very CPU efficient plucked string sounds. If you want to make that skonk sound, you have to write a completely different set of code to produce it. You cannot change one bit <coughs> in the car plus strong algorithm to have it go to the adjacency of the buzzing fret. That just doesn't happen. Okay. 
because software's adjacencies are all linear. And those of you who program know that, that small changes in number values in software produce incredibly linear changes in terms of how your code runs. Software is Boolean. At the end of the day, most programs have a kind of a binary state to them that, again, those of you who program are aware of this. Programs either run or they don't run. There are very few intermediary states. It may not be running exactly correctly, which is to say it's running the way it was written rather than the way you thought you ran it. But inevitably, it either runs or doesn't, and it doesn't go to an in-between state. Whereas hardware does. Hardware operates on a rather extraordinary continuum from the intended behavior of the engineer who designed it to irreversible, smoky failure. And it keeps making sound. You know, one of the formative films of my adolescence year, years was the number eight pop film where Hendrix sets his guitar on fire and the damn thing keeps playing notes while it's burning. Okay? Hard to do with a laptop. Um, think about it, so much of the sound that we associate with analog electronics, overdriven guitar amps, feedback, um, starving the power supply of a bent toy. All of these things are about approaching a state of catastrophe in a physical system and looking at these changes that take place along a continuum from um, total, totally correct operation to complete failure. Failure, by the way, can be modeled in software. That's not the issue. You, know, you can model failure, but self-destructive code is a very, very rare thing to get going. Okay? Um, John Bowers, a wonderful computer scientist uh, and a musician, took a hacking class <coughs> I, I did once at a workshop at UEA. And at a certain point after demonstrating a circuit, I said, these are the connections that make it work like an oscillator, but you can make random connections between any pins on a chip and see what happens. And he said, really? You can make random connections? I said, yeah. He said, you know, I'm, I'm a computer scientist. I've been doing this for 20 years. I've never been able to write random code that runs. Welcome to hard work. Uh, software is deterministic. Once debugged, code runs the same. Seriously, unless there's a corruption in the code, Unless there's a corruption in the hardware, it has a very static, stable quality. Hardware is, as all of us know, very indeterminate. In other words, think about recreating a patch on an analog synthesizer. Or uh, before you had Pro Tools, when you were trying to recreate a mix down sequence on an analog console. Yeah. Or for that matter, tuning a guitar. Tuning a guitar. It's always a question of approximation. And so we struggle in certain genres of music to make an indeterminate instrument as determinate as possible. Jonathan struggles to play the correct overtone on a natural trumpet. We struggle to intonate a fretted guitar when we know that we're fighting against reality when those things are fixed on the fingerboard. On the other hand, in other types of music, that indeterminacy is embraced and welcomed as a factor that contributes to the identity of a work. Hardware is unique. Uh, every object has a finite amount of material and labor that goes into it. And to get from one trombone to 76 trombones means making 75 more. And that takes time and it takes a lot of material. There's a thinginess to hardware. Whereas software is a multiple by nature. Okay? Um, command C, Command V, right? If I program one oscillator in some code and I want another one, click, click. I haven't had to buy another computer. I haven't had to buy another copy of the program. I can just keep doing it. And also, by the way, every copy is the same as the original. And I don't want to go down the, the road of file sharing and everything else like that, but this is a profound change in the nature of what an object is. 
when you lose a distinction between the copy and the original, and the production is essentially effortless activity. Software is tweakable. In fact, this is what we all said in the, in the 70s, Command Z, it's easier to be simpler. Um, there is a tendency when you write code to never finish it, to constantly be tweaking it and updating it and modifying it, okay? Um, it's really, really good for composing pieces, that is, making decisions and then changing them, like writing a book. Uh, it's very good for recording, mixing, making all those little changes, being able to redo and redo and redo. Hardware, on the other hand, resists change. You know? When you build a circuit, you're waiting for that moment when you can finally screw the box together and not be soldering and changing things. You, in general, in hardware systems, you go towards systems of stability as a target point, not transition. You don't think about constantly updating a hardware device. This is why hardware makes very good instruments. You know, when you pick up a banjo out of the, out of the case, you kind of want it to be the same as it was when you put it away the day before. You don't want to have, it to have had, say, an OS upgrade in the middle of the night that causes the sixth string to be lowered by a flat at second. <coughs> that would be unhelpful. Okay. <coughs> On the other hand, once you have software written and it is in ROM or it is in the OS of your computer, it has a curiously inviolable property to it, that it resists change, okay? There are certain domains of software that once they're there, you're stuck with them, you know? And there's precious little you can do while they're in place, whereas hardware is intrinsically hackable, you know? In hardware, in a pinch, you can always open it up and make a small adjustment. You can retune the fifth string on the banjo if you decide you want to try it. Yeah. In a hardware object, there's always the equivalent of a shin bar that you can use to get in your car when it's locked. It's not as good as a key, and if the cops see you, you have a hell of an explanation to make, but it does the job, right? Software works with time, and I think this was for composers who stumbled upon the early computers in the late 70s. This was the biggest thing about it, even more impressive than not having to solder was the idea that software allowed you to losing my place here. Software allowed you to combine three of the critical elements of music as we were conceiving of it at the time, which is it combined an instrument. Yeah? Computers can make sound, right? It included a score. That is, you could create pre-scripted sequences of actions. Long before sequencers came onto the market, for driving MIDI synthesizers. Composers were creating pre-sequenced works of music that resided in the minuscule amounts of memory we have in these computers. And then finally, it could embody the performer. The software could embody the performer. It could make decisions. Instead of having the sequence just run, you could ask the, the program to make a decision at certain points. Should I take the left path or the right path? just like a performer, but less dependent on drugs, alcohol, or money, right? So this was a powerful new paradigm for music creation, and those of you born after the advent of the computer have no concept of what a transition this was. But seriously, to go from the Moog synthesizer or a fuzz box to an Apple II computer was a major transition in terms of how we conceived of what an object could do and what it could be. Did I skip my hardware as immediate? What did I do? Where am I now? Oh, I went backwards. Software works with time. Hardware is immediate. That's what I was trying to say. Hardware, on the other hand, you press a button, something happens. You pick a note, something happens. It's very difficult to precipitate a complex sequence of events in a purely hardware-based environment unless you go to, say, a Rube Goldberg-type machine. Keith Robinson, for those of you on this side. Um, and that is essentially the embodiment of software in those things. No, hardware.
hardware is, again, and this is one of the reasons why hardware makes for such a wonderful instrument, is that there is a very direct causality, and there tends to be a sense of predictability between input and output. Software is great at producing density of texture. As I say, when you have one oscillator in software, you want to make 75 more, it's click, 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 you get them. You can build up amazing amounts of density that seem to be entirely a question of the speed of the computer and the amount of memory you have, and those barriers are falling away faster than we can conceive of a need for greater density. In a sense, you can, you're good at doing orchestral, it's a good environment for doing orchestral type masses, which is the duplication of the same thing over and over again, in the interest of creating a large sound. On the other hand, hardware itself is very often better at creating complex textures, by which I'm thinking about something like the attack on a flute, or the sound of a pick hitting the string. In every stage of computer synthesis and computer modeling, the most difficult thing to emulate has always been the chaotic work that takes place at the onset of a note the first few microseconds. And that is one of the things, the pull of a rosin bow across a string, that hardware systems do brilliantly, and software systems basically only do by a process of approximation. This is at the essence of what we might call Quivala's dilemma of why it is that computer music very often doesn't sound like electronic music, is because there's a certain essential property of chaos that's very, very difficult to attain in software systems. Software is now, software seems to live in the permanent present. Uh, as you know, you are forever updating it, whether it's the code you write, or it's the apps you're using, or it's the OS for your computer. There's never a sense of, this violin was made in 1780 and has remained the same ever since. No, it's, it's in a constant state of upgrade. Right? It's improving and it's replacing things with each improvement. Typically hardware, but also itself. And hardware is yesterday. Basically, as soon as you finish a piece of hardware, it's old. No. It's old. It's time stamped. It is that violin. And this is why there is such a tendency to replace certain hardware tools with software. Because it does not become obsolete as quickly. At the same time, um, my wife made a brilliant observation once, which is that before any given tool is replaced by a superior device, the qualities that don't serve its main purpose can be seen as weaknesses, defects, or failures. Think of the ticks and pops of vinyl on records. Think of oscillators drifting out of tune, tape hiss, distortion. But when a technology is no longer relied upon for its original purpose, these same qualities can become interesting in and of themselves. In other words, in the 90s, as soon as um, digital audio became the standard by which we consumed and produced audio, suddenly there arose a whole interest in record ticks as a sound material. Any of you who listened to German electronica of the late 90s know this. Clicks and cuts out of Thrill Jockey and Mill Plateau in Chicago, same thing. Yesterday comes back. So, lest you think I'm too doctrinaire, I'm, I'm well aware of the fact that there are um, obviously hybrids right, of these uh, two worlds. They don't exist in complete separation. Mm -hmm. Interfaces, the Arduino. The Arduino is a magnificent device, and it came about at exactly the right time to solve a problem that uh, independent composers and institutions like Stein have been working on since the 80s, which was how to interface to software from the physical world. The Arduino is a small computer whose purpose is exactly that, the glue between hardware and software. And it allows you to create these, these, these hybrid systems. But I would say that, that, that a, a hardware-controlled software is sort of like a baby in an incubator, which is, you know, it's great. The baby's there, she's alive, and that's a fabulous thing. And you can reach in with those gloves and tickle it, but what you really want is you want the baby on your shoulder throwing up on your back. That's hardware, yeah? You don't want to have to touch it through the rubber gloves. And rubber gloves are what the Arduino gives us. 
You also have software emulations of hardware, as you all know. I mean, the app market and the plug-in market for computers is driven by the software that emulates vintage amplifiers, certain types of mic response patterns, everything else like that. But what's interesting is that there are some things that are much easier to emulate than others. Now, you can get a very beautiful emulation of a Moog synthesizer on your iPhone. You cannot get the emulation of a dirty pop. Okay. Um, and then we also have the advent of 3D printing and various forms of rapid prototyping, which allow this sort of instant gratification, wish on demand. I want something, I can make it. I don't have to wait. I can make a physical thing directly output from my software. And that's kind of interesting, because it is sort of, it, 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 it's allowing us to flip back and forth between the two worlds faster than ever. I will have to say, though, that there's already been a kind of a backlash about it. There's a very interesting essay by a woman named Alison Arif called Yes, We Can, But Should We, which is about this rush to make anything that you think you want, that it leads to a sort of a surplus of objects at a time when we should actually be thinking a little bit more about material resources and the final outcome of the things that we have made and played with for a day. All right, so that's my, that's my set of bullet points on what I see as the sort of prime distinction between these two worlds. And most of us end up working between the two. I don't think it's possible to live exclusively in one or the other these days. Um, I came of age as a composer in the 70s at the time of the, the, the era of the composer-performer. Yeah. There were all these small groups, the Sonic Arts Union, Terry Riley, uh, ensembles of Steve Reich and Phil Glass. Um, there was this kind of allure of the rock band at the end of the 60s when a lot of these composers realized they were really nerdy. And there was also that idea of retaining more control over your work yeah? by, by performing it directly instead of handing it off to an ensemble. And then, to be perfectly honest, in those days, the orchestras would not touch these composers. Yeah. There were no opera commissions for Phil Glass in 1972. Um, and in, in, in the case of that model of sort of total control, I think that the computer turned out to be a really, really great solution because of this integration of instrument, composition, and performer within one system. And you can adjust the balance between the two. Um, that idea of integration and control, very, very powerful. And I think at the end of the 70s, a whole movement developed based around that as the core technology. But at the same time, that was an era in which the distinction and the prejudice between composition and improvisation were sort of breaking down. And a lot of so-called composers were recognizing that, that huge swaths of the music data bank were based on a great deal of improvisation instead of through composition. And there was a renewed interest in alternative instruments, uh, music from other regions of the world, um, the development of the open form score as a way to acknowledge the presence of a performer as a person who makes intelligent decisions instead of just executing instructions. And I think that those composers and performers who went down the line of sort of embracing more spontaneous and more improvisation-driven performance styles tended to gravitate more towards the hardware systems because that hardware seemed to embody the essence of a performance instrument <coughs> better than a lot of the software, especially the early software. Um, Finally, I, I'd just like to say that one of the remarkable things about people yeah, is they are irrational, that they are not highly predictable. Um, they're not Boolean. And there is a glorious irrationality that sets up as soon as you have a group of people doing anything together, and it might as well be music. And I think that that quality of <coughs> irrationality in humans is what attracts them towards impractical things. But I think sometimes imperfect and impractical objects interface well with um, <coughs> I mean, the unusual inner dynamics of people working together in unpredictable situations.
I think that's about all I have to say. Sorry, and um, I was interested in your comments about people 
and that resonated with me, there were your comments towards the end. The question I kind of had is about um, following on from that, the, the, the distinct, distinctiveness of people and, the, um, and their unpredictability and the interesting things that happen when they get together. Um, it strikes me that one of the things that's missing in our studies of, um, uh, of interaction, I guess, between people and their unpredictability and, and, this, and the hardware systems and uh, instruments they use is that we're at a very early point in, in understanding what people actually do with their uh, instruments and, and um, we have the material objects behind glass in science museum and other places in London but we don't seem to really know much about how things work unless you were there and I'm thinking about um, Robert Ashley and the Sonic Arts Union and all of that unless you were there maybe there's a bit of footage around and some recordings it's still a very mysterious era for someone like me for example other than bring in a bunch of anthropologists and people with recording um, video cameras, what do you think is our best bet at being able to record and understand the legacy of much of um, the music of electronic music of last century, for example? Oof. <laughs> uh, the, the prospects are not good. Um, a fair amount of, of work is actually being done on that here. Um, there, there is a, there's a study group that's, that's working very hard on trying to um, uh, recreate and sort of solidify um, certain works of, of electronic music and experimental music that depended on, on conventional instruments. But the focus so far here has been on ones that are, uh, have, at least have the illusion of notation going around. I think what happened, um, the starting, it's really sort of the development of the 70s, was a very cavalier approach to, to documenting work. Uh, when, you, when the grim reality of life is that nobody but yourself, it seems, would ever want to perform your music, there's a limit to how much effort you'll put into generating notation that could be transmitted outside of your house. In other words, as we like to say, I got better things to do with my time. You know what I'm saying? So there is a very large body of very unassuming work that subsequently has turned out to be quite valuable and interesting. Yeah. And a lot of it exists largely in, in the as oral history, to be honest. And, and you know, in some cases, we're lucky to have, we're fortunate to have some sort of documentation, but remember, videotaping was certainly not ubiquitous until the 80s, I would say. Um, audio recordings don't do a very good job of it. Uh, Wesleyan University has acquired the, uh, the, the instrument collections of David Tudor and David Behrman, both but the documentation of those is very poor and there are graduate students there who are sort of, you know, it's like art historians looking at um, pottery shards coming out of archaeological digs trying to, trying to figure out how the stuff works. Um, I think that uh, <clears throat> you can either get sad about this or you can say, well, you know, maybe this is just not part of the continuum of Western musical culture that has given us this assumption that you know we're always going to have these documents that allow us to play some version of the piece 500 years later. It may be more like what used to be called in my college days world music, which is there's a lot of music out there that's conveyed by oral tradition, and if there's a break in the continuity of that, it's gone. Right? So I don't know. It, it may be that some of this is, is doomed to be uh, rather more ephemeral than the composer may have intended, that their, their fans may want, but that could be it. I think that we're also in a state where, uh, for many, many people, uh, the recording of a musical work is the prime version of it. In other words, I don't think the average consumer of, of um, Funky House worries too much about whether these tracks 
could be recreated by another artist in the future. They just love that one 12-inch dance record, and they're happy to own it. And if somebody else has a tape of it, great. That means if I lose mine, there's backup. That puts rather a different level of value on, on where is the essence of the work. <clears throat> and I think that for an awful lot of music today, if you've got a good recording, you sort of step back from it and say, that's the mess I can help for. It doesn't work for me, but it does work for an awful lot. Maybe I can ask you. I just wonder to what extent your hardware software distinction retro applies to other practices. So, for instance, the, the physicality of, you know, just to take a random example, composing these scores, composing for established instruments, this sort of thing. Do any of those contrasts apply in the same way, or is it entirely different once you're plugged into something? Well, I think you were the one who, who pointed out to me something I'd never thought of before, and had I been a smarter person, I would have, that the difference in the availability of paper between the time of Bach and the time of Beethoven, and how that influenced the, uh, the way you compose and edit. Yeah. I asked my father-in-law, who was a career academic once, after uh, word, processing, word processing was introduced in you know, the 80s on the personal computer. I said, are the, are the term papers getting better? Because when I use a computer now, it means I do many edits before I actually send something out. And when I was a student, you know, you'd, you'd write one rough and one clean copy on a typewriter, and that would be it. He said, no, the papers aren't getting any better. They just get through them faster and get out to play sports. So, um, you know, the question is, does a composer who can use Finale or Sibelius write better music because they can obsess upon correction and, 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 and uh, <coughs> Updates in a way that you know was, was just a lot more difficult when you had to write it all out on paper. I don't know. I don't necessarily think music is getting any better. <laughs> I mean, yeah, 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 it's like my father used to say, history of science is a much more useful area of study than the history of art because science actually gets better and art doesn't. So, <laughs> um. Well, one of the things we've been dealing with here is the fact that the communication of science has got immeasurably better. Mm -hmm. Well, the communication of art seems to have given up to a larger degree. I think a lot of that may have to do with the fact that, 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 that this sort of, um, if not the most important areas of science research at the moment, the ones that are getting the most attention are the ones that, that simply require a very, very large number of people to, to carry out the experiments. And so they, they can't work without the communication. In the, in the age of the amateur inventor of the 19th century, I think, you know, there was a sort of a different standard as to whether stuff was communicated well or not, but... Um, I certainly think that the... Something as simple as, as, as how you get from hand to page, uh, hand to a, read, a readable object, whether it's a text, a, a music score, a drawing, um, that, that, that the means obviously influences the, the way you think and the way you work. Yeah. I mean, you listen to people who, who, who grew up doing graphic design with pay stops and then move into Illustrator. You talk to composers who moved from freehand to, to, to working in Sibelius, and they'll talk about, about the differences. But then if we take the historical comparison, uh, the situation is reversed to an extent whereby um, Perhaps an earlier composer might have been able to assume that you know, the trombone he was writing for was a pretty standard thing, played in a pretty mm -hmm. standard way. Whereas his personal practice of how to compose you know, may have depended on where the light was falling, how many mm -hmm. cups of coffee he had, or whatever. Um, now, hardware has become a much more personal, individual thing, whereas the software environments we inhabit a much more standardized life because it's, it's yeah. simply too much of a challenge for an individual to produce one. Yeah. No, this is true. And, and, and I, I see these scores constantly, you know, where they hyper-specify. It, it started with percussion, to be perfectly honest. I mean, if you look at percussion scores from, say, the 50s onward, you know, and, and, and the, the, the spe degree of specification of the individual instruments, the amount of time they have to spend on that compared to first violin, second violin, you know, it's, 
there's no comparison. The other one I think about though is the Bach. After after you told me about the the wax uh, tap was for Bach, I was damn, that's why they have so many double dots. You know, it's like it saves you writing all that stuff out. And I went to see Einstein on the Beach revival a couple of years ago, and I thought, now I know how he wrote such a long piece, lots of double dots, because he wrote it for you, and he didn't have, you know, he didn't have a computer. So think about that for a moment. That's a long piece of music to write, and he wasn't German. <laughs> Just saying. Oh, sorry. I'm going to take the microphone as a German at this point. No, um, I was aiming. But maybe it's a typically German question because I was thinking about the aesthetic implications of it. I knew you started thinking about them as well. Is composition changing? Um, and and, and uh, there is an experimental German writer, I don't know whether you know him, Hans Magnus Enzensberger, who has written a lot about the, the fact how his uh, writing changed from the times he wrote with his typewriter and afterwards he used a word processor and obviously things like cut and paste that have never been possible before uh, are influencing also composers um, and make things easier in uh, inverted commas of course. So do you think there are any aesthetic implications with um, this hardware and software divide such as more contemporariness and more nostalgic or um, having more control over the stuff and losing control, things like mm -hmm. that, or is that? Well, um, you 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 raised the nostalgia word, which I actually managed to avoid for the whole thing, and and I should make it clear that mm, I was sort of talking about rather arrogantly about these qualities that I regard as being inherent to the object, whereas there's a whole other set of, of issues that come into play, which is our attitudes towards them, right? I teach in an art school, I'm surrounded by hipsters, you know, and hipsters, hipsters, I'm surrounded by hipsters, you know, Brooklyn. And these, these kids, they love analog technology that was invented probably before their parents were born, you know? Um, and some degree of it has to do with sound. Some degree has to do with performability. That the first time they reach out to the front panel of an analog synthesizer, they realize how you can do so many things at the same time instead of clicking and dragging. You know, this is a this is a big innovation. But an awful lot of it is fashion. You know, they take a stance. You know, they say, I like I like narrow trousers and big knobs, you know, or something like that. And and they just they, they, they go down a route that is, quite frankly, you, 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 you have to spend a lot of time asking them why they are making their decisions. Yeah. When, when you teach in, in this sort of a hybrid environment of multiple technologies, you notice people running towards particular things and you want to know why are you there and tell me truthfully. Okay? And that's, that can be rough. Yeah. Is that, I mean, I can confirm that having taught in London for eleven years, yeah. I can pretty much confirm similar things. Thank you. Yeah, I was just wondering what your thoughts would be on um, <clears throat> if you compare like writing a score to coding mm -hmm. and the relation to a score to an orchestra and working in software to controlling the orchestra, like. Style or, mm. or what the really, uh, yeah, how you look at it? Like, could you could you draw parallels between composing and like really going into detail and coding? Yeah, I mean, I mean, they're very uh, they're they're very similar processes because, as I say, I think I think coding is fundamentally a linear a linear process, and the vast majority of of, of scoring. Is linear. In other words, you may you may work on fleshing stuff out, but, but it tends to be the forward motion of the line, which is what carries you. Um, and then you get hung up on, you know, you have all these little speed bumps along the way. I think it, one of one of the differences is that in software, very often, unless you're working in a in a, in a specific environment <coughs> like a sequencer, um, you you tend to move back and forth between sort of instrument design and structural issues with some degree of fluidity. I may just be a more disorganized program than many people, 
and I write all my code. I, I use very few in, in programs. Um, if you talk to somebody who, say, you know, works works in, in something like Logic or Ableton, they may have a, a better a way of distinguishing between the different parts of the compositional process. But I think that it's that you know it's that inherently linear flow of of crafting work over time, and it's only that. Sometimes software, of course, runs, it, it doesn't always run in the same way that a score does. It doesn't go from beginning to end. You know, there's a lot more conditional stuff that can happen in software. So uh, the end product can operate differently, but I think the through, the through writing is probably pretty similar. How many of you, how many of you uh, write texts, like in language? All of you, right? All of you. How many of you move back and forth between um, pencil and paper and a computer. Can you raise your hand if you still work in two months? Yeah. So my wife is, is a, an extraordinary writer and editor of prose, and she has what we call in our family the Stations of the Susan, which is that she will go from sofa to desk to bed and move between clipboard and pencil and computer. And there are multiple permutations of those as to which instrument is at which location. And each one corresponds to a particular stage in the <clears> writing and editing process. And she says, for a long time, I tried to normalize it, and then I just said, to hell with it. This works. <laughs> and I think many of you probably have a similar relationship to just those, that difference, you know, the difference between those two, well, pieces of hardware. You, you kind of anticipated what I was going to talk about, which was about the moment of decision, really. Um, because I have piles of papers all over the place, and yeah. I have computers all over the place, and I move between them as well. Um, but there is, a, there is still a fundamental software hardware distinction, isn't there? And, and it was brought home to me by, by a guest at Sark a few weeks ago, who was an audio engineer, who said, well, it's really simple, you just decide what you want to do, and then you make the software that does it. And of course, that's not fundamentally what composers do, in my experience. Right. It's when the, it's where the decision is made. If you're writing something, the decision is made in the act of the graphite on the paper, mm -hmm. at some ineffable moment, somewhere between the contact of the graphite on the paper yeah. and a moment just after. A you lot of fun. You can't do that in software. No. You have to you have to decide in advance what you're doing, and mm -hmm. actually. Most of the thesis in composition is retrospective. It might it might happen on different scales. Mm. It might be milliseconds, mm. but you can't do retrospective goals mm. in software. Mm. It, it's a lot of artists talk about resistance. They yeah. talk about when they work, they get a particular sense of resistance. That sort of haptic haptic feedback stuff that people talk about so much in game design. And I think that they, that, that does tend to lead the hand, so to speak. And very often there is resistance in programming. God, is there ever resistance in programming? I mean, you're there and it's like, it won't work. But it, it has a somewhat different quality. It doesn't lead the line in the same fashion. My son, is exactly the layout age, he, um, when he was four, his, his banker uncle, my brother, gave him the best computer in the family. He had an early Mac uh, multimedia computer. We would have to ask for permission to use it from a four-year-old if we needed to do something with it. And he was a, like most children who were four, he was a big fan of the um, uh, Tim Burton films, uh, like Nightmare Before Christmas, right? Is it Tim Burton? Yeah, Tim Burton. So he decides one day to make the figure of, I don't know if any of you have seen this movie, of Jack, who's his central character. He's like a scarecrow with a pumpkin head. Your basic, <laughs> basic Americana fright figure. And um, he takes those bendy straws, you know, flexi straws, and he tapes them together. Children love scotch tape. He tapes them together to make the body, you know, two legs, two arms, his body, and then he crushes a piece of orange construction paper to make the pumpkin head. All right, he's dead on, he's got it. And he draws, uh, takes out a Sharpie, and he draws an eye, draws another eye, he draws a nose, he's just about to draw the mouth, and he stops, and he goes over to his computer, he boots up the computer, and it took a long time to boot up an app on those days. He opens his favorite piece of software, this drawing software called KidPix, 
on an A4 piece of paper. He moves the mouse to make a very tiny little U in the middle of this sheet of paper on the screen. He prints it out. He takes a pair of scissors. He goes like this. He cuts out this little white dot, this big, which now has this little crudely drawn U. He gets out a glue stick, puts glue on the back, and puts it on the face for a mouth. At some point, he's neither an idiot nor well, he might be a genius, but he's, he's not. He, it's like it's not as though he had any peculiar phobia or obsession. It's just at some point in the middle of the creative process, he decided that that was a job for software. Yeah, and it was this hybrid object. And and why the mouth and not the nose? And that's not a question you can ask a four-year-old. <laughs> With that, let's thank Nicholas Collins.